Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to this evening's Family Information Series, Understanding Trauma, A Family Perspective. It's great to see so many of you joining us um, and logging on tonight. Uh, you'll know that we started the series last month uh, with an introductory lecture on, on understanding information and, and advocacy for families. And this month we continue um, along our themes uh, of talking about trauma and understanding that from a family point of view. I, I'm really delighted to have Dr. Claude Dowling, uh, the Director of the Psychology Department here in St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, to talk to us this evening about trauma and how families might observe that and experience that uh, from their own perspective. Um, so I'll ask jo Claude to, to join us now and uh, we'll begin the presentation. If you want to add any questions to the Q&A box, please feel free to do so and, and they'll be moderated as we go along. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Welcome. Thanks, Elaine. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to start this, hopefully. In the next place. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So, Let's check it on the beginning. Yeah, okay. So welcome everybody. Thank you for having me and thanks Elaine and Sinead. Um, so just, I suppose, I want to start by just saying well done for being here. I know um, this, is a, this is very difficult to be speaking about trauma. So I think it's probably taking a lot of courage to um, log in today and, and get the ticket to, to come today. Um, and I have a picture there of just the ripples in the water, but, but thinking about the ripple effect of trauma that everybody here who's logged in um, probably has experienced the effects of trauma in their lives from their loved one, um, their families, friends, relationships. So when trauma happens to one person, it doesn't just affect one person, it affects so many people far and wide. And um, so I just want to acknowledge that today, but I know even if you haven't experienced trauma, you've been impacted by it. Um, I also have a side there beside that picture, just to highlight the dark side of human nature. So we all have our dark side um, and some people have really experienced harm um, from another mind, from another person, from another person's dark side. And, and those who experience trauma, as we all have, we all have our dark side and we all have harmed somebody in some way. Um, so just to acknowledge again that you may have experienced harm from your loved one that you're here to support tonight. Um, and that may not have been intentional, but it still may have been harmful. Um, so just, I just wanted to say that and acknowledge that. Um, and, and at the same time, you're still here. Um, so I put your two Olympians there who hopefully are familiar to you. And to say, just to quote a trauma therapist, Dr. Faye, who says that people who heal from trauma achieve an Olympian feat. Um, it takes dedication, commitment, and practice, um, but also the people around those who, who are recovering from trauma are their, their Olympian team. So you're here as, as their team, their supporters, um, and you're as dedicated and committed to them by being here tonight and all the work and all the things that you've experienced with them. Um, so, so trauma doesn't get better on its own. It doesn't get better in isolation. Um, so thank you for being here. And, and I'm sorry you are here. I'm sorry that you have experienced the ripple effects of trauma. Um, sorry, Clodagh, could I just yeah. interrupt you there really quickly? Is there any chance you could put your slideshow into full screen? Um, I've actually tried to do that and it doesn't seem to, to work. Um, OK, that's fine. Yeah. We can leave it as is. Um, yeah, I've, I've tried a couple of times and I'm not okay. sure why it doesn't. Um, it doesn't seem to be clicking that. Yeah, is that's it okay not, to continue? Yeah, that's no problem at all. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. Didn't you? Yeah, no, not at all. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sure it's a bit annoying to see the slides on the side. Um, but thanks. Okay. Um, so, so my plan today is to think a little bit about what we mean by trauma. Um, what you know, what what is the definition of of trauma? Um, and thinking again about how trauma may impact you and and your loved one. So, some language here that I'll explain called parallel lives. Thinking about triggers and what they mean and, and actually why they can be helpful. And then I wanted to explain a little bit about what trauma recovery looks like um, as well. Um, so just to, to start with the definition of trauma. Um, so I've taken this as a quote from Bezel van der Kock and a lot of the references I use are highlighted at the end of the presentation. So he's written a book called The Body Keeps the Score. 
and he defines trauma as something that can be understood as an inescapably stressful event that overwhelms people's existing coping mechanisms. And these experiences can be unspeakable. Um, there may not be any words to describe them. Some people who've had trauma in their lives can have enormous difficulty telling people what has happened to them. Our bodies can re-experience terror, rage, helplessness, as well as impulses to fight, flee, freeze, and appease. And again, these feelings can almost be impossible to put into words. Hence the title of his book, The Body Keeps a Score. So the body may remember, um, and many times traumas happened pre-language as well. Also, it's, you can't really talk about trauma without talking about adverse childhood experiences. Um, so what I mean by adverse childhood experiences are ACEs, which you may have heard of before, are um, events that have happened in a childhood um, that may kind of come under these categories such as abuse, so physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect, physical neglect or emotional like, neglect or abuse, um, household dysfunction, so where a child might have experienced a parent with mental health difficulties, they may have seen or witnessed their parent or mum being treated violently, may have been divorced, may have been a relative who was in prison, or they may have been in a household where there was substance abuse. Um, and these experiences are traumatic in themselves, but they also, the more of these experiences you've had as a child, the more at risk you are for mental health difficulties, for physical difficulties. And that's mainly because your body has been under so much stress and maybe been in so much danger and um, that it processes stress in, in a different way. Um, so these ACEs are often things that we think about of experiences that have happened to children. Um, and again, if you've had many ACEs as well as trauma experiences, it will be harder to manage some of the trauma um, that, that happens in, in adult life if your um, early years have been traumatic as well. I just wanted to put this slide here um, because trauma isn't just about what's happened to you. Um, it's also about maybe what you didn't get. So Deirdre Faye, a trauma therapist I mentioned earlier, she described seven attachment needs. So when we talk about attachment, we mean um, you know, your early relationship with a caregiver. Um, and the task of a child is really to experience these needs from an adult. When you're an adult, you have to find how to experience these needs through your own relationship with yourself. But as a child, you need another to give them to you. Um, so I suppose I'm gonna go through them and explain them a little bit, but just to be holding in mind your loved one that perhaps they haven't experienced these, these things. And, and often I kind of see these seven attachment needs as kind of goodness. Um, so they may have experienced danger, but they may also not have experienced lots of goodness in their early life. Um, so the first one is felt safety. And the idea of felt safety is that you're protected. So as a child that you feel safe, that you're allowed to explore, reach for things, be curious and be out of your comfort zone. And that it's safe to do that, that you have an adult there protecting you to do those things. Another need as a child and as an adult, but, but dependent on an adult as a child is attunement. So having someone who is aware of your emotional needs. So they see you, they, they know you, um, that they know who you are, um, that you feel understood, that your emotions can be regulated, your caregiver can attune to what your emotional needs are, and that you have, felt, have a felt sense of being understood. Um, a third attachment need is reassurance. It's that idea that you, it's okay to want, it's okay to need things, that you're comforted, it's okay to make mistakes, that mistakes are seen as learning, um, that you experience the world in a comfortable way, feeling soothed, feeling calm, feeling safe. Um, and that, yeah, I think that word is what is feeling calm, a calming presence, feeling soothed. Another really important um, attachment need is expressed delight. It's that feeling of being unique, being precious and being important, seeing yourself as valuable. Um, being okay to be different, that you're secure in yourself of what you have or what others have, that differences are okay. Um, again, when you think about a child, um, a parent expressing just joy in the things that they've done, no matter how small. Um, another attachment need is guidance. So feeling um, that you can trust others, that people see the best in you, that they want you to learn and to, to encourage you, but also see you as separate, that those boundaries and that they can see a difference and, in you and, and support you, and that you have a felt sense of being supported by another mind, by another person. And then there's flexibility. 
that idea that life is okay with being gray, that you can take things not so personally, and um, negativity doesn't stick, that there's a flow. And then finally, and this one is really important, and, and again, thinking about your relationship with your loved one, is that um, an attachment need is have an experience of conflict and it being okay, that you're still in touch with the person that you're in conflict in. That in fact, conflict can lead to deeper understanding and closeness, and um, that you can let go of being right, um, but you are willing to, you've had a model of somebody who generate and repairing conflict, so you feel secure in being able to do that. Um, so as I, as I was saying that as a child, we need an adult to do these, but in, in trauma recovery, there's loss and grief if you haven't experienced these needs. Um, you also may not know what you haven't had. So having these in a relationship may actually feel a little bit dangerous or a little bit scary when you haven't had them before. And there might also be a longing for these needs because they're normal, helpful, healthy needs. So we may long for them and, and that may feel uncomfortable. Um, and I actually also might feel a bit vulnerable as well. Um, so even if you're feeling, well, actually, I'm giving those to my loved one in, this, in my relationship, it may be new. Adapting our, the people who have experienced trauma, your loved ones, they may have no problem adapting to danger. They may really know what to do in danger, but adapting to safeness may actually be quite terrifying because it's so new. Um, okay, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Uh, and it's a pity I can't do slideshow here because this, this slide is a little bit overwhelming. Um, I was hoping that I could drop it in one by one. Um, so this is just a, a slide that shows the kind of range and breadth of impact of trauma. Um, so it, it can impact your loved one's thoughts, their behaviours, their relationships, their emotions, their body, and their beliefs about themselves and others. So I'll go through these slowly, and I'm sorry if it's a bit of an overwhelming slide. Um, so your loved one may experience difficulty in remembering. Um, they may really forget things that have happened in the past, but also last week. Um, and, and that makes sense to me because they're under stress, so it's hard to focus and concentrate. They may have difficulty making decisions, they may feel confused, they may have time distortion, so they may not, they may be in trauma time, they may not always be in the present. They may have an experience of having too many thoughts at once, or actually the opposite, where everything is really slow. They may experience the world is not safe. There may be times where a loved one has experienced suicidal thoughts, um, which I know is, is scary for them and for you. Um, they may experience flashbacks, so the past coming into the present in an image, um, often triggered by something that maybe they may not even be aware of, but it can feel like the past has been re-experienced. Um, intrusive images and memories coming back with no warning, um, a sense of a foreshortened future, and self-blame, self-criticism, and often when, when you've been harmed and had trauma and high ACEs, um, it's hard to know who to blame. So often as a child, we blame ourselves. That might give us a sense of control in some way. And when things haven't been under control and we've been quite powerless. Behaviours um, that often people who've experienced trauma um, um, may act on might be abusing drugs or alcohol, medication, often to self-medicate many of the thoughts that, I, that I've described there and emotions. Um, other behaviours might be to withdraw, maybe impatience, irritability, feeling overwhelmed, having strong reactions to small changes, maybe feeling clingy to people, um, finding it really hard to perform tasks that were once easy, self-punishment behavior, impulsive behavior, hurting, self-harm, um, and self-harm can be through lots of different ways, including food, like restriction of binge eating or, or, or purging. Um, and the next one here, talking about relationships. Um, so people who've experienced trauma may have difficulty trusting people because they've been harmed by people. So that makes sense. Another experience, maybe the other extremes are trusting too much. Um, maybe having doubts about relationships. Um, maybe a distorted generalization means that maybe if one thing has happened, that's the way it is for everybody. This happened to me once before, so it's going to happen all the time again. Um, maybe sometimes relationships may reenact trauma dynamics, so patterns that have happened in, in traumatic relationships may reoccur in the present. Maybe feeling critical of others, maybe feeling alienated or alone. Um, and there's a real sense of, of aloneness when you've had experience trauma, maybe feeling that you're the only one that's gone through this. And when you're feeling triggered, feeling really alone that you're the one that's triggered. Ongoing fear of victimization, avoid sexual intimacy, or again, the other extreme, having promiscuous sex. 
um, other um, aspects of trauma that, that are symptoms that may impact your loved one is obviously emotions. So feeling helpless, hopeless, and powerless. Feelings like that may come from the past, but may get triggered in the present. Grief, you cannot do trauma work without grief because there's so much loss and what has happened with trauma and what, what people have lost because of trauma. Um, numbness, maybe a cut from emotions, um, not feeling anything. Constant fear of dread or free, feeling um, unsafe, um, feeling guilty, feeling shame. And again, that's not the person's shame, it's the shame to be with the person who's harmed them, but the shame may be coming internally for them or maybe may feel like it's their own. Feeling disgust or anger towards their body, feeling vulnerable and dependent, high anger, maybe emotional roller coaster, feelings of worthlessness, feeling alone, and feeling a lack of control. You know, I mentioned how our body can, can react to trauma and, and that, that book, The Body Keeps the Score. So feeling overtired, difficulties in sleep, difficulties in appetite, stomach problems, cut off from your body, disgusted and really wanting to be disconnected from your body, vomiting, sweating, chest pains, dizziness, maybe vulnerable to colds and being sick. Um, and then beliefs about yourself. So often the impact of trauma, because it has been unspeakable, or maybe there's been lots of shame around the trauma, but actually the kind of young feelings of it's my fault, I deserved this, I did something to, to deserve this, I must have behaved badly, I'm weak, I'm disgusting. Also beliefs about others, that others can't be trusted, or others are out to get me, or people are judging me. So there's a lot going on, and, and I think you might notice that some of them are extremes, that you can be one end of a continuum or another end of a continuum. Um, and let's go to the next slide here. The, when you think about the symptoms, it can be overwhelming. So I find this helpful to think about the behavior or the symptom at the top of the triangle might be, you know, that you're, you want to fix or the doctor wants to fix or a psychologist wants to fix or your, your loved one want, might want to fix. But if we do too many quick fixes, we're not looking at the pattern. So, for example, if somebody has eating difficulties and we try to fix the eating difficulty, that's fine. So there might have been a period of, of binging or restricting or, or, or purging. But actually, you fix one thing and the pattern may still be there. So the pattern may still come up in another way. Maybe it moves to something else. And um, maybe it's restricting or binging on alcohol. Maybe it's restricting and pulling away from relationships. Um, so what we want to look at in trauma work is not just the behavior and the pattern. But we want to understand the function. And the function goes back to early childhood again. So, for example, when your loved one maybe was feeling danger, they might have drawn on that pattern or that behavior to cope, to seek safety. When they have felt unsafe and not having any comfort, um, they might have sought some of these behaviors or patterns to comfort themselves when there hasn't been comfort from another. When they've been isolated or on their own or lonely, again, maybe they might sought comfort and, and connection to some of these behaviors. When they've been in chaos, um, again, these behaviours, even something like self-harm, might give a sense of control or predictability. So, so my point here is that we, we, we want to go underneath the behaviours and patterns and look at actually why, why is there a good reason for some of these symptoms? Why do they make sense? And maybe they made sense as a child, but actually as an adult, maybe they are now harmful to the person, but also to the loved ones around them, to, to you and to others, as well as to themselves. So I know I've, I've given a lot of, of really difficult messages there, so please do mind yourself as, I, as I'm talking. Um, but what I really do want to instill today is that trauma is not a life sentence, um, that we do trauma therapy. We know a lot now about trauma and how we can change. Um, I think 20, 30 years ago, we thought if, if somebody had uh, um, many ACEs, we didn't know that actually we could change pathways, but actually we can. So new science has showed us that our brain has its own natural way um, of developing and growing at any age, um, no matter what age you are, um, as long as we practice. So I think about our brain is like a road and there's some pathways that are really well traveled that we've got into those patterns and those symptoms and behaviors but actually with support and help, we can carve out a new road. All of you here, I'm sure, have learned new ways of thinking or doing things. Um, and so can our loved ones with trauma. They can learn new ways of thinking and doing things. Um, when you've had difficult attachment experiences and early life experiences, if you haven't had a caregiver giving you those things that I, that I talked about, those attachment needs, 
it doesn't mean you can't learn to give them to yourself or learn to receive them from another. And that, that's really exciting, um, but it takes practice. Um, we all, when we've done something new, have to do it over and over and over again. So practice and patience, but we can rewire our brain. We can learn new ways of doing things. Um, let's go to the next slide here. So this is a picture of a geranium. And um, uh, Deirdre Faye, the trauma therapist that I, that I quoted earlier, she talks about her geranium that wherever, nowhere, no matter where she puts it in her house, it finds the light and it turns towards what's nourishing. It turns towards the light to grow. And that's what we all can do. We all need um, to be nourished. Um, with effort, we can turn towards goodness. We can turn towards things that, that are good for us. And that's what we want our loved ones to do. That's why you're here. And also for you to be able to do this as well. And that it's effortful to turn towards the good things. Our brains love um, to be kind of mindful of danger. And that's a really old pattern. But we can change that and go towards goodness and light, like, like the geranium. So I just want to talk a little bit about what is trauma therapy. Um, and I mentioned before that trauma doesn't recover in isolation, but often people can isolate themselves um, very much because of the stigma and the shame. And, and, and trauma can help, can make people feel, I don't know what's going on in my own mind. I don't feel safe in my mind or my body. Um, and a challenge in trauma therapy is that we can be triggered. So triggers refer to events or experiences that kind of lead to really strong emotions or behaviors, stronger than what maybe others are, react, are reacting to or responding to. Um, and triggers can be a challenge, but they can also lead us in the direction of what to work on and what, what we need. So they can be helpful guides as well. And in therapy and um, doing trauma work, our, our clients, our, our people learn how to recognize when they're triggered, because often they may not know when they're triggered. It may feel actually that's, that's how it is. Um, so what we help uh, people to understand is what triggers them and how it impacts on others when they're triggered. Because when we're, when, when we're triggered, any of us, um, we're in distress, we're stressed, and our capacity to think about another is quite limited when we feel we're in danger. We're just really going back to old survival skills of trying to survive, and um, which was needed when, when trauma was happening. But therapy can slow things down. It can help people learn how to manage triggers and give people alternative choices and, and choice and, and new pathways to how they want to live their lives and how they want to relate to others, but also to themselves. I'm going to talk here. So here's an example of the language I was using at the very beginning when I mentioned parallel lives. So um, it, when things are going well, um, we store things in our hippocampus, which um, kind of records and files memories. And we know that we're in the present. So that line um, helps keep a difference between past and present. There's a firm disconnect from the past. You know you're in the present. An example of this, just to help make more sense of this, would be, for example, if you were meeting a friend for coffee um, and you were waiting for them you know, outside the coffee shop and they didn't turn up, you might be feeling really annoyed. You might be thinking your dark side might come out and be thinking negative thoughts about them. Um, you wait for ages, they don't come. So you're feeling disrespected, you're feeling hurt, maybe you're also feeling a bit worried about them, but your body and your mind is maybe not in a good place, you're, you're feeling stressed. When they finally ring you and let you know, well, actually, I'm really, really sorry, but, you know, I, I got mugged or um, something happened at home or my daughter was sick and I had to go and go to the, the house or whatever and I couldn't contact you, I'm so sorry. Your mind then updates what happened. So you don't stay stuck in that kind of dark side, dark feeling that you had with that person when you were waiting or that worry, you now know they're okay. They didn't mean to not turn up, there was a good reason. Um, so when other things like that happen, when somebody doesn't turn up again, you don't get confused with the past. You don't feel those feelings, they're processed. When you think about your friend, um, you, you don't have the same experience you had when you were waiting for them. So if I go to the next slide, but when trauma has happened, um, that kind of barrier that keeps the past and the past gets blurred so sometimes for many people um, that that barrier and that they're called a dissociative barrier it can be an ingenious way of keeping the past in the past so for many years people may may not go near their trauma history but something small or big can actually then just kind of blur it completely so it could be getting married it could be a stressful situation for the loss of someone 
it could be a new job, it could be a fallout, um, but something can just totally blur and break that dissociative barrier. For others, it's maybe more permeable. Maybe often there's been times where it, the past has come into the present. Sometimes when people retire, they've been working and then they get sick or, 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 or leave their job, actually that past can get really trigger into their present. And the idea there is that past memories, past experiences, when they're brushed against in the here and now, um, for the person who's experiencing something mildly stressful in the present, and if it brushes against their past trauma, it can feel like actually they're back in the past. So you may know who's up with your loved one, something small, is, is it a comment you've made or um, something losing your wallet or something that's happened that hasn't gone to plan and they're suddenly really reacting in a really, really strong way. That's often a time capsule or a time bomb, as some of our clients say, that's connected to the past, a time maybe where they're feeling overwhelmed or abandoned, not understood. Um, and they may not be, imagine they're, they're 30 years old now, they may be acting actually five or six because they may be back in that past where they were five or six and they may feel just as scared. And that's very confusing for the people around them. It's also very obviously confusing for them. Um, and the next slide is that idea that they're, when the past comes into their present or when in their present, it, their, their past is brushed against, it can leave them feeling out of their window of tolerance. So in this slide, you can see in the middle, it's when people are feeling safe, calm, cool, collected, connected. Um, but if something triggers them and brings them out of, the, out of that space, they might feel ready to fight or flight in that hyper aroused state. Again, thinking that's an old survival mechanism that might have been helpful as a child. Um, or it might bring them into a hypo aroused state where they're feeling in freeze, not feeling anything, feeling numb, feeling disconnected and not in the present. And that also is a very helpful strategy when you're experiencing trauma um, when, when you're younger. But obviously in the present, when you want to be engaged in the present and actually your trauma has been brushed against and you're back feeling hyper aroused or hypo aroused, that may not be helpful for you. It's not serving you then, but it may have well been a protector um, many years ago. Um, and, and this window of tolerance, I think I find it helpful for me. I'm, I can be out of my window of tolerance. One of the things that put me out of my window of tolerance, I know some of the clients I've worked with, they put that in the fridge, you know, at home. It's a helpful way to put into words something that they're trying to explain to their loved one. It could be um, a parenting experience. It could be something totally that you, you're not realizing. It could be a smell. And actually it's put them out of the window of tolerance. And just even having that diagram might be helpful. A way of communicating. Um, so in parallel lives, how do you help with that? And what we're asking um, clients and doing trauma work is to help them know, how do you know if you're in the past or in the present? What are the signs? Um, and again, they might find it helpful to let you know that so that you could help them bring them back into the present. What situations tend to trigger the past exploding into the present? And that doesn't mean to avoid those situations, but an awareness can be really helpful. What skills do you have to help you live more in the here and now? Um, what helps you live more in the here and now? Who helps you live more in the here and now? Is there words or support that maybe your loved one and you can, can think about how to do together to help you be in the present? Um, so just to think a little bit more about the stage or type of trauma treatment, Generally, what, what is helpful is stage one, which is safeness. So you're, if your loved one is engaging in all of those behaviours that I listed earlier, or has lots of emotions that are really difficult to man, manage, um, some therapies will look at how do you feel safe in your mind and your body? How do you learn how to regulate a little bit? When you're ready and everyone is ready at different times, it, it's not a, okay, this X number of sessions and then you'll be feeling safe. Everybody is different. Um, but when you're feeling ready, uh, in a way, stage one is to equip you for stage two, where we talk about going back into the past when you're ready to go back into the past. So that might be memory work and um, looking to process some of the memories. So that update I described, if your friend was late or didn't, put, didn't turn up, it's helping you go back to the past to update what actually that happened to me and I was powerless. That wasn't my fault. So you dip back into the past memories to help update them and process them so they don't explode into your present and um, it's called remembrance and mourning because sometimes when you begin to process those memories and you see what actually has happened to you there is such loss and um, so often in stage two um, people who are experiencing the memory work and remembrance and mourning may feel more sad they may you may be worried about them because you may think oh gosh they've got really depressed 
Um, and we would say, actually, that's really good work because you're beginning to feel the sadness and many things that have happened are sad. So feeling sad is actually a really helpful, healthy emotion. The, the trickier ones are shame. You know, we're actually you're feeling shame for something that wasn't your fault. So we don't want mourning to last forever, but it's a really important part of the process. And again, as a loved one supporting your person during trauma work, that might be worrying. So I'm really glad to be able to tell you that, not to worry that actually that's a sign of real progress. Um, and then again, that may, be, may take longer or shorter for different people, depending on, on what their needs are. Um, and they may dip into not feeling safe. So you may need to go back a little bit. It's not all linear where everything um, goes in one direction. But the third stage is reconnection. So where, where your loved one is beginning to reconnect in the world, um, really work on turning towards that goodness, like the geranium, really affable, bringing skills into the present, not letting trauma take over and reconnecting with, with others um, and building a life. And not just recovering from trauma, but actually beginning to flourish and, and, and really um, make up for things that maybe ha have gone or have lost, they have lost. Um, and feeling safe in your relationship with yourself and others. Um, so this diagram here, I've just linked it so you could see when, when you're doing safeness, you're trying to be in the present, um, safe in your mind, safe in your body, being able to regulate your emotions. When we're in stage two, you're often in your past um, and we're only going to the past to help the present be better. Um, and then stage three is often the future, reclaiming the life and getting the life. Um, and here is just some quotes of, of clients that attended some trauma work in St. Pat's. And I thought the quotes were helpful just to give you a sense of what the process can be like. Um, so one person described positive supporting learning experience. It was a profound journey of self-discovery. I truly did find my compassion. Be patient and expect to feel much worse before things slip into place. But things get worse before they get better in, in trauma work. And that can be so scary for those around. Um, Engagement, trust the group process, and the program that's sitting here is, is group and individual. It allows time to build trust and safeness. Be prepared to give yourself the time to, do, to give to the program. There's no quick fix. It's a course that offers a new perspective, an honest, more comforting antidote to the growing discomfort and distress or traumatic stress, a new way to live. But it takes time. There's no quick fix. Patience, go in with an open mind, trust the process. The group process is like a river. Sometimes the flow is steady, sometimes fast. You may feel lost. Sometimes there's no flow, you may feel stuck. In the end, you will get there. Commitment to dedicate yourself 100%. Be aware of the effect it has on your mind and body. So it's, it's, it's tough work. It takes lots of courage to do this work and lots of courage to be around the person who's doing this work. Um, so I just have a picture there of a flower growing in the cracks. And the idea there is that even though trauma work is painful and brings up grief, um, that there's loads of hope and change that comes with it um, and beautiful things and, and can grow from difficult times, and difficult experiences. And that's what we want in trauma work, not just to be OK, but actually to flourish. Um, I just also want to acknowledge you guys for being here today and the courage it's taken to be here and, and to listen to some of this. I'm sure some of you are out of your window of tolerance. So it might be helpful to listen to the recording and go back to it. And I'm still really happy to take any questions. Um, and then finally, just some reading list of some of the books that might be helpful and a website at dirtyfray.com is also a really helpful website and she's on Facebook and there's lots of little videos that might help you um, think about this talk and, and it might make more sense as well to think into some of her work. Um, so the last slide. Oh, just a reminder to turn towards what nourishes you and please do that after today's session as well um, for, for yourself. Okay, great. So thank you, everybody.